If you've ever had the argument, you're wrong, no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong times five, you're wrong times a thousand, you're wrong times infinity, you're wrong times infinity plus one, then you probably already know the truth. Infinity plus one is the same as infinity. And so as the person who said it first, clearly you won. However, if you've ever been on the receiving end of such a horrific pronouncement, then I have good news. You could then say, no, you're wrong times uncountable infinity. You will have won. If you're not careful though, your victory may be a Pyrrhic one. If you don't watch until the end of the video, and they do, then they'll learn a way to defeat you in turn. This is a proof of multiple types of infinity. Buckle up, this is a fun one. Let's start with the infinitely large elephant in the room. Infinity is not a number. This may surprise you, because people often throw it around as if it were a number. But as it happens, it's an idea that has a lot of properties in common with numbers, which are also ideas, but it also has a lot of differences as well. I don't want to go into all of them here, except for to say this. Even the most basic of properties and operations must be investigated and reproven in order to actually understand and perform them when you're dealing with infinity. One such thing is size. To see what I mean, if I asked a little kid how many numbers there are, which usually means they're thinking of the natural numbers, they might tell me the biggest number for which they have a name. In the case of my daughter, that's Graham's number, which she absolutely adores for some reason. However, then you get to play with them a little. You can then say, well, what about Graham's number plus one? And the game begins. Both of you go back and forth saying things like, Graham's number plus Graham's number, or Graham's number times Graham's number, or whatever. And after a while, you eventually come to the idea that there's no limit to how large of a number you can go. Here's a hilariously horrifying large number on the screen, using nothing more than subscripts and Graham's number notation. So, we put a name to the concept of increasing without limit, infinity. So my daughter, being clever, asked me, well, what's bigger than infinity? The instinctual answer is, well, honey, nothing is bigger than infinity. Infinity is the idea of continuing forever, and so there is no bigger. But as I said earlier, anytime we're going to make statements about infinity or its behavior, we're going to have to investigate it first. Turns out she's onto something. We're going to start by assuming that there's only one infinity. In fact, this was the prevailing view until nearly a century and a half ago, so it's a natural place to start. We will try then to keep it that way as we go through this, and only if we are forced to accept a different kind of infinity shall we then do so. Again, as with all proofs, if done correctly, you can feel as confident in the conclusion of the proof as you do about the axioms and definitions that served as its premises. So to compare the sizes of various infinities, we need to find some. Thankfully, we know a few different sets that are of infinite size that we can compare. I introduced these sets in my first two videos. Links are in the description. Let's make sure we're all on the same page with our terms, though. Formally, a set is a collection of elements. For example, the set of natural numbers is the collection of the counting numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, which are its elements, as you can see here. Each number is an element. The number of elements in a set is what I mean by its size, and I will formally call that its cardinality. For example, a set of five elements has a cardinality of five. A set of a thousand elements has a cardinality of a thousand. But what about the cardinality of the natural numbers? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there's no biggest natural number, and so this set will, in a sense, go on forever. That means that no finite number will suffice for the cardinality of the naturals. And so our understanding begins with saying that the cardinality of the natural numbers is infinity. How might we compare the cardinality of the naturals to, say, the cardinality of the integers? Remember, the integers are all of the positive and negative whole numbers with zero. Clearly, the cardinality of the integers is also infinity, but something feels weird about this, right? For every number in the naturals, there's two numbers in the integers. Considering five in the naturals, you have both five and negative five in the integers. Are there then twice as many integers as naturals, despite them both having infinitely large cardinality? That's a good question. The normal method of comparing size, that is, counting elements in both sets, assigning a number to the quantity, and seeing which is bigger, something we do basically instinctually, doesn't seem to work here with these infinite sets, because the first step in that process goes on forever. So instead, let's slice the loaf another way. Let's find a way of distinguishing the sizes of things that doesn't involve straight-up counting. 
the method I want to introduce is illustrated best with the classic example of kids comparing the contents of their bags of marbles. If one kid wants to know if they have more marbles in their bag than their friend's bag, but they don't yet know how to count, what do they do? Well, one way would be to pair them up. That is, take a marble from each bag, put them next to each other, and keep going until either one or both bags run out. If they both run out at the same time, then they know both have the same number of marbles. If one runs out first, then the other had more. This will work for comparing the sizes of any two numbers, and in our case, cardinalities of any two finite sets. And what's better, we don't need to know the sizes of the two numbers to compare them with one another. We can do this in situations when we cannot put the quantity to a number, either because we haven't learned how to yet, or as in our case, it's simply impossible to do so, because it's infinity. Of course, this means we'll have to modify the approach a bit, because in our case, neither bag will run out. First, because these marbles have names like 1 and 5 and 24,098, we need to propose a pattern for pulling elements from the sets to pair them up. This is going to present a problem if we're not careful. If you compare the cardinality of the natural numbers with itself, you can create a pairing pattern that will leave 6 marbles in one set unpaired, like when you pair 1 with 7, 2 with 8, 3 with 9, and so on. This is nonsense. The set is being compared with itself, so there shouldn't be any leftover marbles. In fact, there's an infinite number of pairings that get it wrong, like this, or this, or this. However, if we do it right, there isn't a problem. We get that the two sets are equal if we pair them like this, or like this, or even like this. What we need now is a way of judging a pairing pattern as good or bad. Let's consider the two cases. Either the cardinality is the same, or it's different. If a pairing pattern shows that two infinities share the same cardinality, then we can ask the question, is there any member of the first set that doesn't have exactly one partner from the second, or vice versa? If such an unpaired element exists, then that particular pairing pattern isn't good enough on its own to say very much. However, if you show that such an unpaired element cannot exist, then that particular pairing pattern works, and it's actually called bijection. On the other hand, there's a problem. If a pairing pattern shows leftover elements on a side, we cannot say that one side is bigger than the other. Think about the case in the earlier example. Infinity plus 1 is still infinity, as I mentioned at the top. Likewise, infinity plus 6 is still infinity. So, this strategy is not by itself enough to show that two infinite cardinalities are different, only that two infinite cardinalities are the same. We can get some mileage out of it, though. Let's get back to the question comparing the cardinality of the set of integers to that of the naturals. We've boiled this down to a single question. Can we find a bijection between them? Turns out we can. Instead of marching off in opposite directions with the integers, let's simply interleave them like so. What we get is 0 paired with 1, 1 paired with 2, negative 1 paired with 3, 2 paired with 4, negative 2 paired with 5, and so on. Now we ask, is there an integer that has no mate in the natural numbers or vice versa? No. We can always find that mate somewhere. What this means is that the cardinality, the size, of the integers is the same as the cardinality of the naturals. Great! This leads to some very cool results. I won't detail it here, but you can also use this to find a clever way of showing that the naturals and the quotients, every ratio of integers possible, barring zero in the denominator, share the same cardinality as well. If you want to take a crack at it, leave it in the comments below. Just, if you know the answer already, don't spoil it for others. Now, what about the set of real numbers? That is, the set of every possible decimal. Well, remember, every decimal can be written as an infinitely long sequence of digits, which means we don't have a natural way of counting from one real number to the next. And here's where something very clever happens. I'm going to be simplifying the explanation a little bit, so forgive me if I'm playing a little fast and loose here. But fundamentally, here's the problem. Though it might be hard to come up with a pairing pattern that successfully creates a bijection between the reals and the natural numbers, it doesn't mean that it's not possible in principle. It may be that we just get stuck for a very long time trying to figure out a clever bijection. Forever, in fact, had not someone named Georg Cantor come along. He proposed a novel strategy. 
show that there is a problem with every proposed pairing pattern, and thus no pairing pattern will ever work. Further, he can show that there are always unpaired elements from the reals that can't ever be paired with anything from the naturals. Thus, there are always fewer naturals. Here's how he did it. Let's take a hypothetical pairing pattern given here. It's one of infinitely many, as I mentioned earlier. There's a lot of silliness possible when you come up with these patterns. I built these real numbers basically randomly, but I required that they be in order of size. Further, I didn't completely specify the numbers. The dot 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 at the end of each one, called the ellipsis, means that there are infinitely many more digits that follow. Let's make some observations. My list goes on forever. That's what these ellipses mean. That means that we've paired off all of the natural numbers, which we can see by asking a similar question. Is there an element of the naturals that we failed to pair with that of the reals? The answer is no, though admittedly it happens in the ellipsis land out there somewhere. Another observation is that I am not claiming that this is a list of all reals, just some list of them. Though you may object, wishing that perhaps I selected different numbers with different digits, perhaps using a pattern you think hits all of the real numbers, stay with me, because the thing I'm going to show will apply to all of the things you may have chosen instead, even if you do claim to have caught all the real numbers with your net. Now the stage is set. What I'm going to do is to show you an element that has a few special properties. First, it will be a valid real number. Second, it will be guaranteed to be different from every number on the list of reals that I created, meaning it wasn't accounted for, meaning there's no natural number that could ever pair with it because they're already taken up. We will construct this element digit by digit and by intentionally making it different from each number we've got. We have an infinite number of numbers and we have an infinite digits, so this ought to work out. To build the first digit, let's look at the first digit of the first real number I've got on my list and change it to something new. There, it's different. I had about nine different options and I just picked one. There's nothing special about what I picked. To build the second digit, let's look at the second digit of the second real number and change it to something new. There, now it's different than the second number. We'll build the third digit by looking at the third digit of the third number and changing it and the fourth digit of the fourth number and changing it, and the fifth and the sixth and so on and so forth. In general terms, we will make the nth digit of our built number different from the nth number on the list by changing the nth digit to something new. In this way, we can be guaranteed that our built number will be different from every entry on this list, without exception. It's not the same as any of the infinite numbers on this list guaranteed meaning it's not somehow secretly found on this list anywhere. As I promised, it's a valid real number, and there's no way to pair it with a natural number, because all of the natural numbers, all infinity of them, have been paired up with elements on my list already. This means that this new element exists on the side of the reals, meaning that for this pairing pattern I came up with, there are more real numbers than naturals. Now, wait a second. Didn't I say earlier that our strategy of finding loose marbles on one side or the other wasn't sufficient to show that a pairing was bad? Yes, but here's where we bring everything together. This argument, called Cantor's diagonal, will produce a missed element for every list that could ever exist. That means that every list that we could ever construct will be guaranteed to fail in creating a bijection. This means that there never can be a bijection. This means that the two sets cannot share the same cardinality. And since we're always ending up with extra unpaired elements in the real numbers and never the reverse, it means that the cardinality of the reals is greater than that of the naturals. QED, quod erat demonstratum. So the next time someone says, you're wrong times infinity plus one, you can say, I'm sorry. That's the same as infinity, which I've already mentioned further, no, you're wrong times uncountable infinity. Granted, you're not really talking about whatever their argument was, you're talking about the cardinality of your wrongs being greater than theirs, but hey, them's the breaks. There's a lot more to this topic. Things to look up that are related are set theory, the axiom of choice in particular, and the continuum hypothesis, which asks the question, are there sets whose cardinalities lie between the naturals and the reals? That is a very big question. 
There's also a lot to learn about Georg Cantor and the way the mathematical community reacted to his proofs. The last thing I'll say. There's sets that have greater cardinality than that of the real numbers. In fact, there's an infinite number of them. And if your opponent cites them, then maybe they'll win the you're wrong times whatever argument. More than likely though, you should probably just actually present evidence for your claims to see which one of you is correct and discuss them. Just saying. If this proof did not sit well with you, that's pretty normal. It didn't sit well with me either. In fact, when I learned it, I stormed out of the room. The person would then later go and hand me a book, which I would read and then accept it, but it is pretty normal to find this one a bit mind-bending. If you've got questions on this, please ask them in the comments below. Thank you to Aragami for all you do. Thank you to my patrons for all of your support. I couldn't do this without you. And congratulations to you on reaching the next term in your own Taylor expansion. I'm Derek Taylor, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. If you really like the video, come on over to our Patreon page where you can get involved and see all the cool stuff we're doing.